George Harrison never sought the fame that often surrounded him. He was dubbed the quiet one, the sad beetle, the spiritual one. He didn't clown around like John and Paul and Ringo. He didn't like touring. He even feared for the band's safety. But his influence on the world's most famous band and his work as an activist for social causes sealed his spot in rock and roll history. George was an integral part of the Beatles. Uh, one of the things that he did was he was very responsible for their sound. Few clues to George Harrison's incredible success can be found in his early years in Liverpool, England. He was born February 25th, 1943. His parents were a bus driver and a homemaker. George was the only Beatle whose young life had been fairly undramatic. He was the one that was least keen on, on stardom. He was the one that was least, um, but at the same time, he, he was the one that was the, the most self-contained about it. He, I suppose he, it, I think it, a lot of it was to do with, with secure family background. All the other three Beatles came from what can be described, I suppose, as broken homes. In Liverpool, a teenage George rode the bus to school with a kid named Paul McCartney, who was a year and a half older than George. The two loved guitars and the same kind of music. Paul introduced his younger friend to the Quarrymen, a band that included Paul and another Liverpool lad, John Lennon. Paul introduced him to John, and, and Harrison got in on the strength of his playing. You know, John heard him play and said, OK, well, all right, well, I guess we'll, we'll carry him along. George may have been young, but he was the most talented guitarist of the bunch. He was allowed to join, and in 1960, the band became the Beatles. No one, especially George, could have guessed what was to come. He was driven by his passion to be a musician. It wasn't, how can I become famous? It was, how can I play music? What can I do that will give me pleasure? So when the fame came with the music initially, it was great, of course, lots of people were listening to the music. But uh, among the Beatles, he was the one who enjoyed least all the mass adulation. And the frenzy did not give him pleasure. In February of 1964, the Beatles appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. The Fab Four became the most popular band in America. That's the same month, by the way, that George Harrison turned all of 21. I don't really fancy 21. I'd much rather like 20. You know, it's sort of a nice round figure and all that. It was about this time that Harrison started experimenting with songwriting and the Beatles with movie making. During the making of A Hard Day's Night, Harrison met a young model named Patty Boyd, who had one line in the film. The two married in 1966. Harrison sought more of a private life, he complained about the touring, even felt that the Beatles' safety might be at risk. Back in the 60s, George was afraid of violence being uh, executed against the Beatles. He was afraid of, of the Beatles being assassinated literally, you know, in, in yeah. 1966. So when it actually happened to Lennon, it was just shocking for, for George on all those levels. The band's last live concert was in San Francisco in the summer of 66. With his wife, Patty Boyd, Harrison developed an interest in Indian mysticism, an interest that soon influenced the music of the Beatles. I think the single thing that George brought was his interest in and his introduction of Indian music, Eastern music, um, into rock and roll. I think any exploration of non-Western music in pop uh, was a direct result of George Harrison picking up a sitar and getting interested in Indian music and meditation and, and leading the Beatles to India in 1966-67. Um, that's a pretty revolutionary thing. Patty Boyd not only encouraged her husband's interest in India, but inspired one of the Beatles' most successful songs, Something, written by Harrison. It was a beautiful love song. Um, it was written for Patty Boyd, who he was madly in love with at the time. And um, it's a melody that, that is timeless. And Frank Sinatra actually called it the greatest love song of the last half century. Something topped the charts in the U.S. Other songs penned by Harrison, like Here Comes the Sun, proved to be big hits, too. But there still was reluctance to record Harrison's songs. He grew up in, in, the, in the big shadow cast by John and Paul, but in a sense, the sibling rivalry made him a better songwriter. He strove to equal them. The Beatles split in 1970. Harrison would say the biggest break in his career was getting into the Beatles, and then added the second biggest break was getting out. 
he was very frustrated. I mean, it's no accident that he came out with All Things Must Pass, and at the time that was a triple album, which was almost unheard of at the time, and it was sort of his way of saying to the Beatles and the rest of the world, this is the material you would have gotten had these people, had these two, John and Paul, allowed me to, to write more songs. Of the former Fab Four, Harrison scored the first solo hit with the release of All Things Must Pass. It included the single, My Sweet Lord. But Harrison lost all the royalties on that song when a court later ruled that the song was based on the chiffons He's So Fine. In 1971, Harrison organized two benefit concerts in Madison Square Garden. The cause? Poverty relief for the people of Bangladesh. The concert for Bangladesh brought together um, Eric Clapton and Bob Dylan and Leon Russell, big rock stars of their day. He was the first, the pioneer of that sort of thing. Harrison followed up the success of the fundraising efforts and the subsequent recordings made from those concerts with another smash release, Dark Horse, in 1974. Its dark theme reflected a troubled personal life. His marriage to Patty Boyd soon ended. He later married his second wife, Olivia, who gave birth to their son in 1978. Harrison enjoyed sporadic success in his last 15 years. He had a solo hit in 1987 with I got my mind set on you. And he teamed with veteran rockers Bob Dylan, Roy Orbison, and Tom Petty, and others to form the Traveling Wilburys. He even dabbled in record and film producing, funding the Monty Python film, The Life of Brian. He really was a true Renaissance man in that his interests encompassed a lot of areas, but he never went screaming for the credit. The man who never courted publicity found himself in the spotlight for reasons unrelated to any of his business or charity efforts. He was treated for throat cancer in 1998. Harrison blamed it on smoking. He used to play his guitar and he'd have a cigarette on one of the strings. You know when they tied the string to the top of the guitar and the strings would be loose, he'd sometimes have a cigarette and they would. he was a heavy smoker when he was young. In 1999, Harrison survived a near fatal attack while in his sprawling estate in southern England. An intruder stabbed the musician, puncturing Harrison's lung. For much of his career, he had worried about attacks from deranged fans, a fear that deepened with the assassination of John Lennon in 1980. With Lennon's death, and now that of Harrison from cancer, only two ex-Beatles remain. Even when I saw him last time, and he was uh, obviously very unwell, he was still cracking jokes like he always was. Still my guitar, this week, the music world lost a legend in George Harrison. What can you tell us about the man and the musician? Well, he didn't like you too very much. Um, you know that? Yeah, yeah, I do know that, but we loved him. We really did love him. And, uh, I mean, the Beatles, you know, wrote the map for a group like you two. And, uh, and he was, he was a quintessential part of it and, you know, brought a special songwriting genius that's easily overlooked. And I, I, I think there's a sort of unknowable quality, a kind of mysterious quality about his music, which made him very attractive character and gave the Beatles a, an extra dimension, really. You mentioned the songwriting. Paul McCartney and John Lennon get so much credit mm. for the songwriting, for what made the Beatles. But when you look at some of the gems that George Harrison came up with, it really is remarkable. He does really leave a songwriting legacy. Mm, no, we claim him as Irish, you know. I think three of the Beatles uh, are sort of Irish. And because Liverpool was, you know, across the road from Dublin, a lot of people emigrated to Liverpool. And I think there's a certain melancholy in the Irish that, that you hear in, in George Harrison's songwriting. And, I mean, he's, his is the only one that I think Frank Sinatra covered. Something in the way. Yeah, something in the way she moves. I mean, so, you know, it's funny because when you hear his, his music played now on the radio today, um, it's, it's, it's a sort of overwhelming sadness um, that was already in the music, that now you sort of, now it's, his, his death it kind of almost allows you to uh, surrender to. And you can identify with that not just as a musician, but as being Irish as well? Yeah, I mean, I do. I mean, look, for us, the, the Beatles are untouchable, and um, uh, we still look to them as models of what can be achieved 
um, when four people get into a room and start experimenting. And, and much uh, like you guys, four guys who got together young and went and went so far. Yeah, took over the world. and they were mates, and and uh, before they were a band, the same as you two. Um, I, I'm not. It's kind of sad that two of them are gone now. Uh, uh, and I, I, I think we have to be very, um, we have to, it's always worth reminding ourselves just how lucky we are to, um, to be at alive at a time when we grew up with the Beatles. Can you give me an example of how you can see influences of Beatle music in U2's music? Just being in a band. Just, you know, at a garage band. You know, when you're in a, in a band it's like, it's you against the world. Do you know what I mean? It's, and if you come from a, a neighborhood in Dublin or Liverpool and you, you, you come to America and you discover the roots of soul music and blues and stuff that may or may not have influenced you but certainly has opened your ears and eyes up. It's a, you know, they, they were the first to do that. Now something you share in common with George Harrison, he was a man who saw his fame, who saw rock and roll as a platform to go something beyond, to look at problems of others, to look at causes that some people might not seem as popular or worthwhile. Do you admire him for that? Well, I, I, I can remember um, as a teenager, um, he, you know, I heard about the floods in, in, uh, in Bangladesh via George Harrison. I mean. He that's was just, ahead of his time. That's just the way of the world, isn't it? You know, when you're a teenager, you're not watching the news. Uh, and so it takes sometimes somebody that you look up to or whatever to just to turn you on to a particular problem and what we might be able to do about that problem. So the concert for Bangladesh was way ahead of its time. I think, I mean, I think it, it probably wore him out. These benefit things do, and he's probably been asked to do, I know I am, all the time. You know, you, you know, you have to... You have to be very careful about these things. You only get a few punches every every year to make a point like that. And uh, um, but it went, whenever he could, he did. When we return, how the rest of the world remembers George Harrison. I grew up with the Beatles. I love the Beatles. They brought me so many happy memories. It's a rocking in the wake of the world, my job is a play. To me, he's just my little baby brother. Uh, we grew up together. Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. I think I'm gonna be sad. I'm devastated, obviously, like everyone is. Um, he had a long battle with his cancer, um, but I saw him a few weeks ago. And he was full of fun, like he always was. wonderful man and a uh, fine musician. But most importantly, I think he was a, a very loving person. Full of humour and um, I don't think he really wanted to be a famous person. So this is the famous Beatles. I think he he, he wanted to do his own stuff by himself. See the love that's sleeping While my guitar gently weeps You're gonna say you love me too Why did we grow up with the Beatles? You know, their music uh, and the band, the personalities of the band were the background to our lives. I grew up with the Beatles. I love the Beatles. They brought me so many happy memories. Something in the way she moves attracts me like no other lover. Um, I bought every record they ever had, and I feel so sad. And I've been crying a lot today. I don't want to leave her now. I 
I think some of the time his contribution musically was overlooked. Being beat up and battered around Being sent up and I've been shut down and Let's hope now that people recognise what he actually did give. You're the best thing that I've ever found And only with her Reputations changeable Situations tolerable He wrote with great, great sensitivity. I think he wrote about things that really cared. Because, I mean, we've known it's been coming for a long while, but it still doesn't prepare you for the day when it actually happens. We just had so many beautiful times together that that's what I'm going to uh, remember him by. The lovely guy who's full of humour, as I say, even when I saw him last time and he was uh, obviously very unwell. He was still cracking jokes like he always was and uh, he'd be sorely missed. He's a beautiful man and uh, the world will miss him.